This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the monthly meeting of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. The Vegetarian Society is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 to promote human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. It's one of the largest local vegetarian societies in North America with more than 1,500 members. And now, it's time for our special guest speaker. We're delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstein, Jr. Dr. Esselstein is a preventive cardiology consultant in the Department of General Surgery at the renowned Cleveland Clinic. He has been president of the staff and a member of its board of governors and is the immediate past chairman of the clinic's breast cancer task force. Dr. Esselstein received his undergraduate degree from Yale University and his medical degree from Western Reserve University. He's widely known in the health community for his groundbreaking research in preventing and reversing heart disease and has published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific articles. His topic tonight is Poor Nutrition, a Weapon of Mass Destruction. Please welcome Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Thank you, Alita. Coronary heart disease need never exist. And if it does exist, it need never progress. I'd like to take a moment to say for my wife and myself how deeply we have enjoyed our visit to Hawaii. We had uh, never encountered hosts that were so gracious and kind and generous. And the friendship that has been extended to us in many different ways has been deeply appreciated. The thing that I think is so sparkling about this entire Hawaiian Vegetarian Society is the reason that this exists is because of leadership. What you see on the screen right there now before you is the Cleveland Clinic building where I have an office on the eighth floor. This hospital is like all hospitals does nothing about health. This is a cathedral for sickness. And as you can see from the blossoms in front of the building, this was taken in February. <laughs> Just checking. This is the headline we had in Cleveland about a year and a half ago when we had the threat of West Nile disease. And it was concerned because somebody from the west side of Cleveland might have died of this got headlines. But how many hundreds and hundreds of patients had died in Cleveland of heart disease that never got a headline? It's old news. When Dr. Herrick first described the coronary artery disease and a heart attack back in 1914, that was news, but no longer. It just happens we accept it. But when does it all start? Now, <laughs> look at this young lad. He's getting a little chunky, and if you look carefully over here at this little pet, he's getting a little bit enlarged. And I even think if you look carefully at the fish and the relatives in the wall, they could be doing better. But the key is where you look at the television and what is playing on the television. The golden arches. And Dr. Castelli of the Framingham study has said, when you see the golden arches of McDonald's, you're getting close to the pearly gates. Back in Ohio, where I'm living at the present time, before we had British Petroleum, we had Sohio Gasoline. And this was one of their ads to try to not only encourage consumption of gasoline, but unfortunately also the manufacture of cardiovascular disease. 
Dave Thomas, who was the great pioneer and founder of Wendy's from Columbus, Ohio, famous for doing his own ads, but he didn't tell us about his quadruple coronary artery bypass that he'd had. And you all remember the, the Whopper. It takes two hands to handle the Whopper with Burger King. And who had the largest hands in the United States who was recruited? And in the 1970s, every time you saw the ad for Burger King and two hands handling the Whopper, you saw Wilt Chamberlain. Where is Wilt? Wilt has died of heart disease. Now, we know that this is not a disease of the elderly. This is a photograph I took in leaving Vietnam in 1968. We know that from the battle casualties in Korea, the battle casualties in Vietnam, at the average age of 20, 80% of these GIs at autopsy without a microscope were found to have gross evidence of coronary artery disease. Obviously, as this same pattern continues, these are the people that are going to be having the heart attacks in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. But from an epidemiological standpoint, World War II was a fantastic breakthrough. It was recognized that when the Axis powers of Germany overran Holland, Belgium, and occupied Norway, they took away their sheep, their cattle, their goats, their chickens, and literally these populations were subsisting on a plant-based diet. Grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables, fruit. It was so powerful that when you looked at Norway, you try to see what happened in 1939. There was an absolute plummeting of deaths from cardiovascular disease, that is, strokes and heart attacks, even though this was a time of greatest personal stress. But look, look what happened with the cessation of hostilities in 1945. Here, in a time of greatest personal stress, when they're absolutely were destroying these diseases, they once again resumed the same type of eating of the meat and the dairy and the oils, and the disease came back. So much so that Emile Picard, who was the pathologist in Belgium, was telling his students in the pathology arena at the autopsy, he said, look at these plaques. We, we never were seeing these during the war years. It was extremely powerful and a message to all of us about this disease. Now, we know that there are certain cultures where the disease is virtually absent. If you look at the rural Chinese, the Papua Highlanders in New Guinea, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico, virtually no coronary artery disease. Now, you're going to have to switch gears with me for a minute and get a little scientific. If you look under A, you'll see a yellow arrow and a blue arrow. And these are right along dye, which is inside a coronary artery. We're now going to do this, and first we're going to look at the ultrasound of where this yellow arrow is pointing. So we switch over here to D. Now what you're looking at with the pointer right now is the tip of the ultrasound catheter. That's normal. And what you're looking at, I'm, I'm outlining for you the dimensions of the normal artery right here. We then go back and we go over to this artery again, and we take the blue area, which is just a few millimeters downstream from the yellow. And we go over to blue, and we do the same thing with this ultrasound. And what do we see? Here's the tip of the catheter, this sort of metallic looking object in the middle. And here is that nice little lumen of the artery, right in here. But lo and behold, what is this rascal here? That is a vascular arteriosclerotic plaque. And the first thing that happens is that the artery accommodates this plaque and it tries to maintain the dimension of the inside of the artery, which it does. So that the fact that you have a normal angiogram does not at all preclude the fact that you could be loaded with coronary artery disease. You can obviously see a difference here. On your left, this is a normal artery with a nice, firm, strong, even musculature. And these little cells lying on the inside layer are the endothelial cells, which I'll say more. Obviously over here, this is a heavily diseased artery, and you might be saying to yourself, when this final opening here, which is now so tiny, blocks off, this person is going to have a heart attack. And that's what was our conventional thinking for a number of years. And it still accounts for about 12 or 15 percent 
of heart attacks. But many people who have this degree of blockage, when it completely finally occludes, they will not have a heart attack. Because on the outside edges here, they will have formed what we call collaterals. These small, tiny vessels develop in response to the fact that the heart downstream is not getting enough oxygen. And though those vessels are not enough to prevent the patient from having angina or heart pain, they are enough often to protect the patient from having a heart attack. There's enough blood going by that even if this final blockage occurs, they'll not have the heart attack. All right. So this mechanism accounts for 15% of heart attacks. Then this is the most important slide that you'll be seeing tonight, how 85% of heart attacks occur. What you're looking at is an artery with blood flowing in this direction. And on the side of the wall of the artery is the drawing of what we consider to be the plaque. And my arrow is trying to show you the cap over the plaque. And what happens in 80%, 87% of heart attacks is that this plaque is filled with foam cells. And these foam cells are filled with your bad cholesterol. And your bad cholesterol inside the foam cell begins to elaborate chemical sub substances that are going to thin out this area right at the upper end, right here. That eventually gets as thin as a cobweb. And now, the sheer force of blood ripping and flowing over that thin cobweb, it results in a tear. And we call that a plaque rupture. When your plaque is ruptured, you are now having extravasation or loss of. Plaque material is oozing out into the flowing blood. When that occurs, and it starts oozing out through this opening, the opening widens, and that material that comes out activates platelets which respond by causing this clot. And this clot is now in a cascade of events, leading to a larger clot, which in a matter of minutes completely blocks the entire artery. So dear old Uncle Ned goes out to his pickup truck, never sick a day in his life, sits in behind the wheel, turns the key, and that's the last thing he does. He has ruptured his plaque. The thrombosis has started across, completely occluded, and now all of the, the heart muscle, which is downstream from this blockage, has lost its blood supply and is losing its life. And if that is a massive bit of muscle that is lost, then Uncle Ned is going to have a massive heart attack and die, or he's going to have a significant heart attack. So this is the mechanism that is key. So what do we do when we treat this disease? We obviously want to, therefore, put into reverse this series of events. And I want you to keep thinking as we talk further tonight about, right here, this whole process. We want to keep that cap over the plaque thickened. Because if you keep the cap over the plaque thickened, you will have made yourself heart attack proof. All right, a couple words in the language that I despise. Moderation. Moderation literally <coughs> kills. In the 1990s, we had a whole series of large studies in Australia, Scandinavia, and in uh, England, as well as in this country. And they showed that when you took a statin and lowered your cholesterol, that you could present fewer new heart attacks, fewer new heart attack deaths, and 30% fewer interventions were needed, such as angioplasty or heart bypass. But what about the other 70%? This is not cancer. This is a benign disease. And how can we accept the fact that 70% continue to go on and have progression of the disease? When your whole focus is on a mechanical treatment of this disease, there's a significant mortality. In a 10-year period, 250,000 people, one quarter of a million people die immediately during these procedures. How many people died in the World Trade Center? 2,900. How many die in 10 years having their intervention? A quarter of a million. Talk about weapon of mass destruction. 
Morbidity, a lot of the people that survive had a heart, have a heart attack, have another stroke, have infection. The expense of the cardiology budget, budget presently is a quarter of a trillion dollars per year. And if you do have a successful intervention, there is an increasing failure rate and the benefits erode with the passage of time. My approach is I ask the patients when I counsel them to think of their heart disease as a low-grade brush fire. And at the present time, most physicians are treating this not pouring gallons of gasoline on the fire, but you're still pouring quarts of gasoline on the fire. And as a result, the patient may have their first bypass, they'll have more disability, there'll be progressive stenosis, they'll have to have a second bypass, progressive disability, and eventually death of disease. Again, a benign disease. I don't want my patients to put a single thimbleful of gasoline on the fire. I want the fire to go out. There. Out. Now, here's the, this is, we'll just back up for a minute, and here's the problem with moderation. When you talk to moderation to this entire room, you know, you're going to get many, many different opinions. Some are just going to say, I, don't, I won't have any tonight. Others, I'll just have half. Somebody else may be even more aggressive. Dwayne, halfway through his hearty man breakfast, felt several of his small arteries slamming shut. Well, for years, this was a cartoon that I had in this uh, presentation. It's now the actual truth. When Dr. Vogel took two different groups of Hopkins medical students to McDonald's, one group ate the cornflakes, the other group ate the McMuffin breakfast. He did a so-called brachial artery tourniquet test, where when you have the blood pressure cup pumped up over systolic pressure for five minutes, you measure the difference in diameter in the brachial artery with an ultrasound. Because when you release the tourniquet, we have what we call compensatory vasodilatation. And it is there in all of us normally. It was there after the cornflake breakfast. But 120 minutes after the McMuffin breakfast, it was gone. Clearly showing that literally with a high fat meal, there is immediate injury. The Manel Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia has shown us when they compare people who are eating a 35% fat diet like the American people, 20% or down to the 10 or 11 percent, which I had in our research patients, only one of those parties completely loses their craving for fat after 90 days. Yes, that's the group. It is down to 10 or 11 percent. So this evening, I want to just focus for a minute on our 12-year arrest and reversal study. Actually, right now, these patients are at, most of them are at 17 years. But this was a study that was reported uh, in the peer-reviewed uh, literature in, the, in preventive cardiology. The epidemiology data that I sp shared with you earlier was clearly a great motivator for this. And since I had to continue with my regular surgical duties, this was limited to 24 patients. And they all had severe tri triple vessel disease, ranging in age from 44 to 68. And the goal was to keep their total cholesterol well under 150 and their bad cholesterol, their LDL under 80, just as we see in those nations where the disease is non-existent. The diet was to be plant-based of 11% fat. I did use a cholesterol-lowering medication as a supplement in most of these patients. There was no meditation that was required and there was no structured exercise. Now, it's not that I don't think that exercise is wonderful. It's not that I don't think that meditation is wonderful. But the rock upon which this study was most likely to flounder would have been lack of patient compliance. How do you get compliance in these patients? They didn't know that this was going to work. A number of these patients were so ill they had been sent home by expert cardiologists to get ready to die. There was nothing that I could see in my review of the literature that suggested that these nations where the disease was non-existent, that it was due to the fact that they meditated or that they had structured exercise. So I also took a mantra from what I'd used for patients with cancer. And patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer. Patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their physician or by their family. 
And I made darn sure that these patients were not going to feel abandoned. I, first five years, I saw every one of these patients every two weeks myself and went over every morsel they ate, and they had a full blood cholesterol determination every two weeks for five years. So they were getting feedback immediately whether they were achieving that 150 goal and getting that LDL under 80, as we had said. And that was uh, happening. Now, the other thing is, you, if you pile all this in, onto patients, and you've got to, if you have them trying to meditate 20 minutes in the morning and they get up, meditate 20 minutes again and later in the afternoon or early evening, 40 minutes on the exercise bicycle, plus the most significant nutritional modification that they've ever known, something's got to give. Each of us has within us just so many behavioral modification units and they knew and I knew that I wanted everything focused on their nutrition. I was a very uncompromising, authoritative, and yet I think caring presence for them. We wanted them to eat the grains, that's all your cereals, breads, and pasta, legumes, lentils, vegetables, and fruit, but no oil, no fish, no fowl, no meat, no dairy, no oil, no monounsaturated oils like olive oil or canola oil. There are six wonderful studies in the literature that clearly show what a rascal these are. There is not one study in the literature that shows you can arrest and reverse this disease with those kinds of oils. They do supply extra fat. Olive oil has 16% artery-clogging saturated fat within it. When I wrote to Dr. Thomas Lee, who was the editor of the Harvard Heart Letter several years ago, because I'd been getting it for years and I really admired Dr. Lee, and he's a thoroughly as a skilled and excellent professional, but he had some articles in there on the use of the so-called heart-healthy fats, such as olive oil. And I wrote to him and I said I was puzzled and skeptical about his article on the heart healthy fats. Could he please provide me with the references that would support that? And I also sent him the references that I had that showed that it clearly was a detriment. And I also sent him a copy of our study. Six months later, he wrote back, Dear Dr. Esselstyn, thank you for sending me that material. I would agree with you that as we proceed to address this most difficult of diseases, we should remain flexible. No data. So, uh, as it stands, uh, oil is out. The key is you have your inter initial interview with the patient and spouse. You must take time. No physician seeing 40 patients a day can do this. Now it takes me about, if I'm doing an individual couple, it may take me up to three hours. And you might say, well, how can you do that if you're in a busy, busy practice? Well, you, you as a physician don't always have to do it. We have been able to counsel and show nurse clinicians and uh, physicians assistants how this can be done. And they can also do it with a group of 12, 15, or 20 patients uh, theoretically at a time. But you must spend the time with people to have them fully comprehend this because the reason our study stands out and is different from uh, all the others is because of attention to detail. Before I would counsel somebody, now, they have to agree there is a phrase that they will forever give up, which is, sweetheart, this little bit can't hurt. So, they had the uh, bi-monthly visit, they had their blood pressure and cholesterol checked, we had periodic group meetings together, and they in, in liked the fact that Ann and I were also eating uh, the same diet. The baseline cholesterol for these people, as an average, when they started, was 237. As you can see on the next slide, during this first five years, they kept it well under 150, and their bad cholesterol, their LDL, was well under 100. It was actually a 76 in the first five years. Triglycerides remained stable. At 12 years, they were still well under 150, and their LDL was down around in the 80 range. Again, triglycerides were stable. But this was the one that really made their money. Their bad cholesterol was so low. And what do we find? This is about as small an improvement as your eye will see. And this is a 10% improvement in the left anterior descending coronary artery in a 67-year-old pediatrician. 
the arrow here in 1987 is 10% narrower and it's, it has widened 10% here. These angiograms, I might add, have all been reviewed in triplicate in our angiography core laboratory by two senior technicians who have great expertise in national trials. In addition to doing it in triplicate, they had a gap of six months to avoid bias of recall in this analysis. Now here we have a 58-year-old factory worker with a 20% uh, improvement in the circumflex artery that you see here, and it's 20% wider over here. Certainly, this can be done. And this security guard, who was 54 years old and retired, this was a 30% improvement from here to here in his right coronary artery. Now, this next slide I'm going to show you is of a young colleague of mine, and I use his name freely because I've had him at national meetings. Dr. Joseph Crow was age 44 in 1996. He began to get chest pain. He had a cholesterol of 156. He did not smoke. There was no family history. He was not overweight. He was not hypertensive. He saw cardiology and everything seemed to check out normally in September, October, November. He finished his surgical schedule one day and then suddenly felt the elephant sitting on his chest, this severe crushing pain radiating in his jaw down his arm. And he had a heart attack. And the heart attack was in his anterior descending coronary artery in its lowest portion. It was too long a segment to have the common intervention of angioplasty or bypass surgery. And uh, he was quite depressed and discouraged with three young children and a young wife, and he came out to supper. Ann and I uh, had him out on a Sunday night with his wife and said, uh, Joe, you know, you've been eating the toxic American diet. You've got this disease. The other things aren't going to be available to you. You've got to go to the plant-based diet. He said, okay, I'll do that. But I'm not going to take the cholesterol-lowering medication. Well, he became the absolute personification of commitment to the diet and nutritional change. His cholesterol went for the next two and a half years from 156 down to 89. He was like a rural Chinese. His bad cholesterol went from 98 down to 38. And what happened was, as you see here, if you go over here, this is the normal part of his left anterior descending, and down here it becomes terribly diseased and moth-eaten and irregular. And then two and a half years later, what was this? It was all cleaned out. It was all absolutely smooth. This is the most exciting result that we've uh, had, and obviously we saved this one for Hawaii. But what it does is it shows you that, given the opportunity, your body contains this fantastic therapeutic powerhouse to heal itself. But you have got to pay attention to the absolute detail. And what is so exciting for Dr. Crow is he now knows every four to six weeks when he has his cholesterol checked and it's in that range that his vessels have become eternal. <laughs> but there were six patients at the outset of the study who I knew simply were not going to follow the program. So I released them from the program. I was on an absolute bare bones research budget. And these six patients were released back to their expert cardiologist back in 1986-87. I followed them over the next 12 years, and these six patients all had progression of their cardiovascular disease. They had 13 new cardiac events. Four of the six had bypass surgery, one an angioplasty, and another died. However, what about the other 18 that stuck with the program? Well. We looked at what had happened to them in the eight years prior to coming on to this study while they were under the care of expert cardiologists, and those 18 patients had 49 new coronary events, increasing angina, worse disease progression, etc. However, these same patients, when they came on the study over 12 years, 17 of those compliant patients had no further coronary events. 
one of those patients after six years even know he didn't go back to eating dairy he didn't go back to eating meat what he did do he just began eating these so-called zero fat per serving products example zero fat Entenmann's morning breakfast pastry now we know that the FDA by law allows the food manufacturer to have at least up to a half a gram of artery clogging fat in each serving of Entenmann's but if it's a half a gram or less the manufacturer can say zero but my seven year old granddaughter is going to have five of those but the he-man is going to have ten servings of Entenmann's and he not, is go, not going to have it alone he's going to have at least two swipes of the zero fat per serving promise on each serving of Entenmann's and each serving of zero fat per serving promise has a half a gram of artery clogging fat so by the time you've had your ten ser servings of Entenmann's morning breakfast pastry with the, pr with the promise you've now had 15 grams of artery clogging fat but you're so good at breakfast that come lunchtime you're going to have the zero fat alpine lace cheese the zero fat Kraft mayonnaise and the zero fat salad dressing and then you come home at night and you walk into your kitchen and there's your lovely wife and you wrap your arms around her look over her shoulder at the counter and then whisper those faithful words oh, sweetheart I've been so good all day this little bit can't hurt now how are you going to get the metabolism of a rural Okinawan eating that kind of a diet that's lethal and that's what actually gave this man his disease back and we he had to have a, a, a bypass but he now he's back with the flock what do you get with this diet there's no you don't die from the diet there's no mortality you don't get sick from the diet and the exciting thing is rather than have the benefits erode with the passage of time these benefits continue to improve with the passage of time and most exciting of all these patients are empowered because as much as we respect the cardiologist or the cardiac surgeon they're not investing their health with those individuals the locus of control for entirely turning this disease around resides with the individual patient themselves and that is such a powerful entity for these patients to know that they are the ones that are in control and can abolish this disease that was destroying them now switching gears quickly for a minute the other disease that is a, the other organ system that is affected by the same disease is our brain if you look at 500 Swedes over the age of 85 one third will have dementia if you carefully analyze that one third one half of that one third will have vascular disease and by now you know that that's something that we can completely avoid and Megan Cleary from the West Coast and her team looked at over 11,000 MRIs of the brain and what did they find that by age 50 Americans begin to develop in their brain these little unidentified white spots which we now know are little strokes that begin to occur at age 50 you're walking you're talking you're driving your car you're playing golf you don't even know it's occurred it's a tiny little stroke but as these continue into age 60 and early 70s memory goes cognition then goes and finally when grandpa comes downstairs on Sunday morning in his bathing suit with his scuba gear on on Sunday morning and he's in the basement asking for his waffles we got a problem because what do you see I counted these the other day in this slide there are over 90 of these little unidentified white spots this is a brutal injury to one of the most beautiful organ systems that we have in our body and it need never occur and sadly a lot of it is not reversible but there's a fascinating other element that should be very motivational for all of us and that is in the paper that came out of the New England Journal at the end of March of 19 of this year of actually of 2003 by Vermeer from Belgium he studied patients over a three-year period who already had these unidentified white lesions 
from age 65 up to 95. And a very significant number of these patients developed Alzheimer's disease. And what was most provocative about that issue was the editorial that accompanied this article from the Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York City. And two very senior expert neurologists had the feeling that as a backdrop for the development of Alzheimer's disease, it is, it is almost necessary to have this type of vascular injury occurring, which sort of lays the groundwork, sets, sets the whole stage up for the development of Alzheimer's. And Aramenko, a French physician, did a fascinating study. Actually, this is the largest artery in the body. It's called the aorta. And as the, the blood is pumped out of the heart into the aorta, it goes behind the heart, then down uh, into the abdomen and then into the legs and so forth, as well as up to the brain. But just as you develop plaque in your coronary arteries, you can develop a great deal of disease on the wall of this aorta. And Aramenko, who was a French physician, had people swallow a tube with a little ultrasound on the end, which, is, which was anatomically resides very, very close to this ascending aorta. And he was able to take these Frenchmen and divided them into three groups. Those that had one millimeter of atherosclerotic debris growing on the inside of the aorta, those with one to 3.9 millimeters of debris, and those with over 3.9 millimeters of debris. And then he followed them for three months, and lo and behold, which group had the highest rate of stroke? Not surprisingly, the one that had over 3.9 millimeters of debris, because as the blood churns out of the heart, it knocks off these little pieces of atherosclerotic debris, and they don't all get around down to your toes. They go right up the path of least resistance up here into your lovely brain. And that's how many of these little strokes occur. And also, when you have a coronary artery bypass operation, the surgeon has to put his clamp right on the side of this big aorta to sew in the bycraft graft. And if at the time that he's clamping this aorta, you are also monitoring the middle cerebral artery in the brain, what you hear is this with an ultrasound. In other words, his clamp goes on here and at, on the outside of the vessel, but on the inside, it knocks off all this debris and it goes roaring up into your brain. And we now know that that ex explains to a certain extent the fact that over 52% of patients who have this procedure, when carefully measured with neuropsychological testing, have it a permanent loss of a significant amount of cognition. This happened to be a patient who came to my office with a heart problem, but he had to stop five times walking along the Skyway because of severe pain in his calf because he also had a circulation problem in his leg. And I sent him immediately over to the vascular lab and here's his pulse volume in his leg. After seven or eight months of treating his heart aggressively with this nutritional profile, he buttonholed me one day and said, Dr. Esselstyn, we haven't talked about my leg in about seven or eight months and I want to share with you I'm no longer stopping five times. It used to be then four, three, two, one. He said, I'm not stopping at all. He said, Don, back you go to the vascular lab and lo and behold, what do we see? Just with, again, nutritional modification, he had healed the circulatory problem in his leg. I'm going to finish up and uh, with some work that is in progress right now. And it all came about because when you treat patients who have severe angina with their heart pain. A number of these patients were telling me, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, this was within 14 days of starting to treat them, my uh, heart pain is already better. My angina seems to be going away. I'm taking nit less nitroglycerin. Well, how can that be? I was convinced that we hadn't yet melted their plaque away that soon. Well, let's put some science into this. Here's what we did. When the patient first came in, this happens to be a 58-year-old bus, school bus driver from Youngstown, Ohio. His cholesterol at baseline was 261. Before I saw him, he had a PET rubidium dipyridamol scan of his heart muscle. And if you're yellow or orange, it means that your blood is getting nicely into the heart. But if it's green, as you see here, this is not so great. But in 10 days, we got his cholesterol down to 126. And then six weeks later, we repeated his scan. 
and he now had completely reperfused the heart muscle. Blood was getting where it should be under stress. How does that happen? Here's another one. Baseline cholesterol 248, this whole wall of his heart was not perfusing well. It took him 12 weeks, but then he had begun to reperfuse this whole wall of his heart. In 10 days, his cholesterol had come down to 137. This was my champ. The only thing higher than his 290 cholesterol was his body weight, 300. And here was his first before I started treating him. In this particular projection, the heart is supposed to look like a nice, tight donut. And here, it, the wall is not even perfusing. At three weeks, he was improving, but he wasn't there yet. But by six weeks, at the bottom here, he now is completely reperfusing. He had failed two heart operations. He was lying in the intensive care unit with angina at rest when we first saw him. And he had the unmitigated temerity to call me from the 18th hole of the golf course, complaining that he was still having occasional chest discomfort, which disappeared completely when he lost 60 pounds. And this is uh, one that I think I want to make you ask you to think about. This was a stockbroker who was 57 years old with a cholesterol of 248. And here he is, again, like a donut, but he's not perfusing this area right here. It's green. And what happened? He dropped his cholesterol in 10 days to 137. And when we repeated his scan in three weeks, he had reperfused. I'm convinced that we can do some other things to make this reperfusion happen faster. When I say reperfusion, what do I mean? I mean getting blood back to those areas of the heart that it cannot get to under stress. Why does this happen? Why are they reperfusing? Why are they getting red cells there if their plaque hasn't gone away? What seems to happen is the following. When you profoundly lower cholesterol in these patients, you reestablish the capacity or the ability of that inner lining of the coronary arteries, the endothelial cell, to once again manufacture the most potent vasodilator in the body, nitric oxide. So that when these patients are under stress, instead of vasoconstricting the heart blood vessel, it vasodilates. And if you are familiar with Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous, is like the fourth power, the radius. So if I can just get a modest increase in diameter in the downstream coronary vascular bed, I can get a huge increase in flow. But if you can reperfuse these patients in three weeks, why do they need bypass or angioplasty? Would it be appropriate to give them a chance to do this first? And here we are back at ground zero. Which hamburger caused this problem? They all did. And here's the artist's depiction again. Remember when we started, how thin it's getting here? But with these patients under therapy, that part of the cholesterol plaque, which is soft and filled with lipid gruel, is going to be resolved. And look at here. See how the cap over the plaque is thickening? And I don't care if they never get rid of this residual. The blood flow is going to continue right through that artery just fine. And with this thick cap over the plaque, that patient has now made themselves heart attack proof. Homocysteine is another risk factor that we like to have down under 9. Our group of patients was about 8.5. And if you take, if you're eating the plant-based diet and taking multivitamins with vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid, this should uh, come down nicely. Now, suppose there are some of you in the audience who might be saying, I'd like to know what the status of my arteries is because I don't know if I really want to completely commit to this program. Well, you don't want to have the test on the left because that's where you have to have a catheter in your groin, run up through your aorta and into your coronary arteries. But you might want to think about, if you remain to be convinced, there is a new thing called the cardiac CT. And cardiac CT with just a little dye in your vein, in 20 minutes, they can get these lovely, lovely pictures of your coronary arteries and tell you whether you've got any mischief. This is just another view of a couple of them. For this thing. That is a 
a little bit of an apology to Leonardo da Vinci throwing the ravages of olive oil on top of this uh, lovely painting. I borrowed this slide from my friend T. Colin Campbell. For those who are having trouble understanding the ravages of the Mediterranean diet, here this high rate of heart attack here, even higher in Britain, the United States, and then suddenly when you get rid of the olive oil in China, heart disease practically non-existent in rural China. Now, one of the stumbling blocks is the American Heart Association, the National Cholesterol Education Program, and the uh, National Research Council. We are supposed to be able to have this covenant of trust, a covenant of trust with our government to give us the safest information about what diet is best for our health. And they recommend fat up to 30% of calories and a cholesterol up to 200. With those guidelines, disease has never been shown to regress, and by the contrary, it has been shown to progress. So we have guidelines from our government that literally guarantees that millions of Americans, if they follow those, will perish from these diseases. Looking at the National Research Council in 1989, the conclusion was that there is evidence that further reductions in fat may confer even greater health benefits, however. The recommended levels are more likely to be adopted by the public because they can be achieved without drastic changes in the usual dietary patterns. Why not tell the public the truth and let them decide how frustrated they'd like to be in achieving these goals? Because we know from the Framingham study that 35% of patients who develop their first sign of heart disease are going to have cholesterols between 150 and 200. I'm taking a little jab here at our own institution, and then I'd like to wrap this up and open it up to questions. Cleveland Clinic, where I come from, is world famous for its interventions. Angioplasty, stents, bypass, and they always have these big banners around, and this is, I should update, this is now eight years in a row. It's on the second floor that we perform all this great and wonderful things uh, with bypass, but it's on the first floor that we actually create the disease because you see, we have very skillfully have, uh, this is the golden arches here, and for those of you who don't like that, we have over here a thing called uh, Pizza Hut. And so we really uh, try to touch all the bases. These are a list of all the wonderful physicians that I've known in my 35 plus years at the clinic who have been ravaged and destroyed and injured by cardiovascular disease. But we didn't learn our lesson very fast because more recently we just got a big advertisement. We had a new product in our cafeteria, so we're still working on this. However, in August, Eric Topol, the chairman of our Department of Cardiology, had sort of a conversion, at least in his public statement, when the study clearly showed it's not your bad genes. We cannot cure this disease until we address the fundamentals of lifestyle. And we as physicians have got to change our whole approach to health in the 21st century. We can't just treat people with drugs. I mean, it's so disappointing to me. I was in a men's health conference about 10 days ago, and the whole emphasis in hypertension and diabetes and in strokes and in heart attacks, it was all about drugs. And, no and nothing about the fact that these diseases don't even exist. We've got to change our commitment, not to just really pick up the pieces as people have fallen over the cliff. The key is to do this. The key is to build a fence and have everybody walking along the cliff. I am so tired of people talking about risk factors. Every American is supposed to learn about risk factors. Why? Because as long as we're learning, we're eating the American diet, most of us are going to perish from heart disease, one out of two males, one out of three females. And you have to know about these risk factors if you're walking toward the edge of the cliff. Well, change the whole diet program and we'll walk along the edge of the cliff. And then we won't have to have this nonsense of learning these risk factors because we want to be sort of a, a gentle people and not have to have everybody have their chest sawed in half and have veins taken off their leg. And this happens to be the foot of an elephant. And this happens to be a baby chicken. And if you use the gossamer touch in your diet, then it means that you will save your artery. Now, many nations don't need this talk we're having tonight, but Gandhi said that at first when you have these kinds of new ideas, they will ignore you. Later, they will ridicule you. And then hopefully later, you will win. 
But these guys are in trouble right now. These are American youngsters, and you know where they're eating. Now, therefore, when you do achieve this absolutely wonderful state of having your arteries clean and being, becoming heart attack proof, you can do whatever you want with it. What I've learned over a career of medicine is that the key in all of research is persistence. And I particularly like this photograph of this young maiden in the Knife magazine in 1939 trying to learn to do the splits. And just last week in Seattle, somebody got a photograph of her and she had got it right. And I'd like to thank you for this evening and I'm going to, at this point, turn this over to question and answers. The question is, when I said no oils, do I mean no nuts, flax, or avocados? Uh, you can have flaxseed meal, fine. You can get all those nice omega-3s. I think that's wonderful. Flaxseed meal, a tablespoon on your cereal. Some people can uh, grind their own. Avocado is probably wonderful, but I must say that in patients who have heart disease that come to me, I don't let them have the avocado. The same thing would be true, I think, those that don't have heart disease. Uh, walnuts particularly have omega-3, and they're quite wonderful. But don't go overboard. You've got to be very careful. If you're going to eat these foods, if you're going to eat flax, a lot of, uh, if you're going to eat a lot of avocado, if you're going to eat a lot of nuts, you've got to know what your cholesterol numbers are. In the entire 80-year history of the Cleveland Clinic, I don't recall anybody who ever came through the doors of the Cleveland Clinic saying, my God, help me out, I'm protein deficient then it's not going to happen. I start out my day trying to see what I can do to avoid too much protein. Protein sometimes got to, somehow got to be somewhat magic. And it's really, uh, you're going to get all, all you need and, and more besides. If you get too much protein, then it begins to be difficult and hard on your kidneys. Not to mention the fact that if your protein is, is meat or milk, then we have the problem of accelerated osteoporosis. I think the important thing, first of all, today is to try these patients who don't have heart disease, to try them on a nutritional profile. And they've got to do the following. And this I find practically no physicians that I know do this, but they should. When the patient will come in and tell them, look, I've tried nutrition, my cholesterol is still 180, I can't get it down. The doctor has no idea what you're eating. You have got to get a physician who will go over every morsel you've eaten for two weeks. It doesn't take that long. It takes maybe three or four minutes if you've got it all written out. And he, he or the physician, has got to be aware of having gone to grocery stores to know what if you're eating any of these zero, so-called zero-fat preserving products. Because time and again, I have found that when patients come to see me, they say they'll think they'll have to have a statin drug. No, they just absolutely are not eating correctly when they start out. I don't have a problem with cholesterol that it goes low if you're just eating a plant-based diet and eating wonderfully. Your body will take it to the level that it's, your body will make the cholesterol that it needs. I was uh, counseling a, a man who was about 44 years old because his father had died of uh, coronary disease in his 70s. And this man had a young son who was age 17 and Jimmy said to his dad, look, if Dr. Esselstyn is treating you for this heart disease, Dad, why shouldn't I be starting to eat this way at 17? And he was a schoolboy in, in Boston, and he was an excellent oarsman rowing on their schoolboy rowing team. And they'd qualified for the championships in Bulgaria. So he began eating like his dad was eating. And they came back from the championship, and his dad was going to go to get his cholesterol checked. And Jimmy said, Dad, I want to have my cholesterol checked too, because I've been eating like you, and I want to see if mine cholesterol is in a safe range. His father's was 144, and Jimmy's total cholesterol was 71. The title of this, this presentation this evening, although it's focused on cardiovascular disease, had been really about a malignant nutrition as a weapon of mass destruction. Well, we know when you're eating this way, you're not going to be obese. We know when you're eating this way, you're going to lessen the likelihood of heart attacks and strokes. You're going to decrease your high blood pressure. And there's absolutely, I think, no question that prostate cancer in the male, breast in the female, and colon in both is going to be well served by this diet. 
Well, what you're talking about, if you're talking about just plain sugar and honey, that's called uh, simple carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates have zero in the way of nutritive value. Zero. If we want to have a dessert that's delicious and have ice cream, well-ripened bananas, cut them up, freeze them, then push them through your very strong juicer. And just like Bill Harris did night last night at a wonderful party that he had with his lovely wife Georgia, they demonstrated this in spades to us, what you can have. So it's, there's no end to the kinds of desserts that you can have without overloading your system. Talk about the role of S-A-L-T, salt, yes. You can get along with wonderfully without it. The, the DASH studies that had to do with hypertension, the second DASH study clearly showed that when the patients eliminated sodium, that their blood pressure came on, under much better control. And you certainly don't need to, you don't have to have the salt for taste. But we don't use any in our household. We just uh, enjoy the natural taste of food. And you had another question about, besides salt? Well, with certainly with cardiovascular disease, you have the hypertension. As far as other diseases with osteoporosis, osteoporosis is kind of fascinating. When you're getting a lot of animal protein, you're putting yourself at risk for osteoporosis. Dairy products, milk, and what happens is that the amino acids that are in these animal products contain a lot of sulfur, which then turns into sulfuric acid, as you meant, metabolize it in your body. And that acid is much too of a, a great a burden for your kidney, which has to use a buffer. And the buffer it uses is it takes your parathyroid hormone, which goes to your bones, mobilizes calcium and phosphorus, which in turn now buffer the acidity in the urine. But by that time, those minerals are lost as well. Phosphorus and soft drinks, coffee, uh, inactivity, and certainly salt is a, is a culprit in terms of osteoporosis as well. Ruth Heydrich has shown us how much stimulation can get to the bones through actually through running and, and that kind of activity. The bones feel the stimulus and the bone will lay down new bone. But with that, I'd like to once again say to the Hawaiian Vegetarian Society and all those wonderful folks who got me here and who have given you the leadership that is so remarkable for the organization that you have, a deep, deep thanks from uh, Ann and myself. Thank you, Dr. Athelstan. That was a wonderful and rare privilege to hear your, about your work and your thoughts. Thank you again for coming. Please enjoy the refreshments, join the Vegetarian Society, and join us next month. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.